I'm Ross Berkeley. I'm the uh, course director for the High Risk Emergency Medicine course. This is actually the 30th year this course has been in existence. There are multiple people in this audience that were not even born when the course uh, originated. I'm looking in your direction, guys. Um, this is actually the 10th course that I've directed, and I really think you're going to be uh, excited to be here. Hopefully, at least, you'll be uh, gaining something from this. We have spent a lot of time gathering some incredible faculty from all over the country. I really think you're going to learn a lot over the next couple days. Um, the goal of my talk initially, as well as over the next two days, is really to give you first uh, some of the ideas about the uh, climate that's really out there in terms of medical legal liability and help you all navigate through the landmines. This is not intended to scare people. This is not intended to make you think that this is all doom and gloom. Um, we're going to provide you strategies, um, and it's not just about CYA, and this is definitely not about practicing defensive medicine. Um, I do believe in defensive documentation, um, but what we're really going to help you focus on is how to improve patient safety, look at things from a systems per uh, perspective, and evidence-based practice. And what I'm going to do uh, in the next 45 minutes or so is actually give you an overview of the evidence behind malpractice in emergency medicine. Um, there's not a ton of literature out there, but what there is I'm going to present for you and hopefully give you some uh, better ideas about uh, some of the things that can help protect you. Uh, we're going to look at real cases. Um, all the cases we discuss are closed claims that have actually occurred in emergency medicine. Um, we're going to look at uh, both the uh, malpractice carriers from across the country as well as an internal risk retention group uh, from our company. When I think about the scope of the issue of medical malpractice, a lot of the times as emergency providers, I kind of see ourselves uh, like these sea lions that are just trying to hang out and do their thing. And then there's an orca somewhere out there really praying and waiting for us on the shore. Um, and that really is a lot of the times the way things will run, that very often things are unpredictable. Uh, there's a lot of things in emergency medicine in general uh, that can really put us at risk, and you know that somebody's out there just waiting to bite us. And the data out there is really difficult to, to get uh, because there's a ton of insurers. They tend to play their cards close to the deck uh, in, ter so in terms of releasing their data. Only every few years do they release some of their closed claims, and there's very limited data that's out there. But what I'm going to do is at least show you some of the things that are out there. Um, so first, this is a study uh, that looked at 41,000 physicians and 46,000 claims. And what they found basically is on average providers spent 51 months of their career at some point involved in medical litigation. All right? um, and typically, at least uh, back in this study from 2013, the average time from filing to the resolution of a claim was over 20 months. And you can see here when we look specifically at emergency medicine, about 13% of the average emergency provider's career is going to be spent with an open malpractice claim. Right, this is just what the data shows. Another study, when you look at 41,000 physicians, about 350 of them were in emergency medicine, 7.5% of these emergency physicians had a malpractice claim open in any given year. All right, so this is very common out there. And then you could look at the time lag, at least, in terms of how long it takes until most um, claims will settle. You can see here, at least between two and three years, about 90% of them will settle by that point, but some go out to four or even five years as an average length for some of them at least. But you can see kind of how they'll typically close. Now what we're really looking at in general, and this is data from the, the CRICO database, uh, the Controlled Risk Insurance Company, they release uh, benchmarking reports every five to seven years or so. And you can see the top diagnoses in emergency medicine cases, orthopedic injuries being the number one, at least from their database, so we're usually looking at missed fractures, um, stroke, uh, things along the lines of uh, PE or vascular thrombosis, MI, and then sepsis. And you can see how the indemnity starts to rise in particular, especially when you start getting into sepsis. We're talking about almost a million dollars in a lot of these cases. And the top allegations, when we look at things, it turns out that the most expensive thing and the most common thing tends to be diagnostic errors. So we're usually looking at either a missed diagnosis or delayed diagnosis. And you can see about a quarter of the cases also involve the management. So not just the diagnostic aspect, but the management aspect too. And this is actually relatively universal. This is uh, data from the doctor's company, so a different insurance company. And you can see roughly the same. Um, a little bit more than half of the cases involved a diagnostic failure. In particular, the failures we tend to see are missed MI, missed CVA, and spinal epidural abscess. And we'll talk about a lot of this over the next couple days. 
And again, you can see you know, roughly about one in eight cases involve something about the management aspects, and then 3% of the cases involve a failure to order a medication, in particular TPA and antibiotics. And we're going to see a trend of more and more cases coming along the lines, at least in my estimation, over the coming years. I think you're going to see more of this. Right. Now, when there's a diagnostic failure, in other words, a missed diagnosis, it tends to cost more. All right. The average indemnity that's paid out for ED-related uh, cases with a diagnostic failure is about half a million dollars. Now, if, it's not, if you don't miss a diagnosis, the average payout is a little bit more than $200,000. You can see it's clearly a huge difference, more than double the amount just for missing it. But in particular, when there's an error involving the history and physical exam, look at the amounts involved. All right, it quadruples the amount. All right, now typically, this comes down to documentation. All right, it's not necessarily that the exam wasn't done, it's that the exam was not documented. And again, this is something we're going to try to help instill in everybody over the next couple days about how to prevent you having that problem. Frequency of cases, there's some data about this, not a lot, uh, but it's kind of nice to see at least the breakdown, again, from the CRICO benchmarking report. You can see in academic medical centers, on average, about 1 in 20,000 cases will result in a lawsuit. And in community hospitals, 1 in 30,000 cases. All right, so roughly about 50% lower likelihood to be sued in the community than in an academic center. And this is actually relatively uh, recent uh, data within the past year uh, that, in interestingly, uh, that at academic centers, there are higher financial losses in non-resident related cases. So the average case that did not have a resident involved was a little bit more than $156,000 paid out versus $51,000 in cases where there's a resident involved. But when there were residents involved in litigation, it typically involved either vascular access or lumbar puncture. So this should give everybody at least who works in it. And I would say that this probably would align also with those of you that are supervising APPs, that these are typically the areas where you might be at slightly increased risk in terms of supervision. And at least this, it's hard to, to know for certain, but this is what's at least suspected right now. And then breakdown by specialty, CRICO just released a massive amount of data uh, within the past year, looking at 124,000 med mal cases over 10 years. And their benchmarking report, you can see here at least, uh, that for uh, emergency medicine in particular, uh, we have the second largest uh, incurred losses, second only to OB-GYN. Um, but you can see we're actually not the number one out there, and that's actually orthopedics all the way out here. Uh, so that's in terms of at least of volume, ortho gets sued more often, uh, but we're really up there. Right. Now, Aon is another carrier. Um, what they've seen, and here's some good news, at least, is that their claims frequency has actually decreased uh, by about 10 percent since 2012. Uh, this is the first positive data that I've seen since I've been uh, running this course. It's a very, very encouraging sign to see at least that the claims frequency, again, roughly what I showed you before, uh, one in 31,000 cases. Uh, now, on average, the amount of money that's involved in these cases when you look at the expenses plus compensation paid out is $172,000 per claim. And that's up from $135,000 just a few years prior. They anticipate, basically, the amount paid out will go up about 2% every year. And for this year, they're anticipating that roughly uh, $5.73 will be paid out for each ED visit. Right, so you can see there's a lot of money uh, that's involved in this here. So this is a numbers game. We're in Las Vegas right now. It's all about the odds or beating the odds. All right, so if you see 2.5 patients an hour, do 10-hour shifts, do 15 shifts a month, you're going to see roughly 4,500 patients a year. If you're at a slower shop and you only have to see two patients an hour, then you're going to see 3,600 patients a year. So on average, based on that data, that means that everybody in this room can, be expe uh, can expect to be sued roughly once every seven to eight and a half years. That's just what the data shows. That's kind of scary in a lot of ways, but it's also that's part of the price of doing business. This is what we do. And so we should expect that, at least that it's going to be in there. Now we can help you minimize uh, that risk, but you can't completely get it away. Now, one encouraging thing, again, is that this used to be a lawsuit every six to seven and a half years. So this is a positive trend in terms of the frequency is decreasing for emergency medicine, and I'm really encouraged to see that. Because I'm kind of curious by a show of hands, how many people in this room think that it's easier to practice emergency medicine now than it was five years ago? Because I don't see any hands going up unless everybody's asleep. Because it's true, it's getting harder, we're seeing more patients, the amount of pressure is rising, and it's a little bit harder to do things, so it's encouraging at least to see that there's less lawsuits happening right now. 
Now, when you look at what the information shows out there in terms of the claims and the care provided, um, this is one study that looked at almost 2,000 cases where uh, at the VA, money was paid out in malpractice, and then they actually went back with independent panels and looked to see whether there was any substandard or negligent care, and they only found substandard care in about a third of the cases. So money gets paid out even when the care is appropriate. And that might not be very surprising to a lot of people. Now, when you look at the PIA database, which is another malpractice carrier, you can see 11,500 closed ED claims, about 29% settle. Only 7% of these cases go to trial. And that's actually about what we see in a lot of carriers. Usually it's about 5% of cases will actually go to trial. And the vast majority of cases, when they go to trial for emergency medicine, will have a defense verdict. Right? People want to find for the ED provider. They want to believe that we're doing the best that we possibly can. They understand that we're under tremendous strain. So most of the time, it'll settle in our favor. The exception actually is usually when it involves anything neurologic. With those cases, it's only about 50% found in our, in our favor. So it makes a big difference if you've got a stroke or anything that leads to paralysis along those lines, really change the things. Now, what's also interesting here is, at least based on this database, that in about only in one in five cases, you could find that no medical error could even be identified. All right, so again, you're going to end up with lawsuits even when there's not a medical error. This from the New England Journal of Medicine, over 1,400 closed malpractice claims that they analyzed. Here again, when you look at the data, it shows when there's an injury and a medical error, and that was in about 60% of those cases, money gets paid out three quarters of the time. Right? When there's an injury but no medical error, money still gets paid out one quarter of the time. There's still money that's paid out. Now you can see there's a small slice of that pie that's missing, and that's from the other 3% where there's not even injury, and money still gets paid out one in six times. Right? And there's a lot of reasons behind that, too, whether it has to do with cost, whether it has to do with the emotional impact and the stress on the person who just wants out. Right? There's a lot of reasons why you might see that. And the money involved is amazingly high when you look at national data. So this is from the National Practitioner Data Bank, and you can see at least that the dollar amounts were dropping between 2003 to 2012 and then it started to rise to almost $4 billion in 2015. All right, so 11% rise. Now you can see at least the most um, recent data that I had access to is from 2017, and you can see we're kind of on an upswing again right now, so unclear whether we're going to continue in this uh, upgoing trend or not, uh, but we're talking about almost $4 billion a year in payouts. And when you try to break it down by location, you can see that this really, what makes a huge difference is where you live and where you practice. All right, so you can see the total pay amounts that, uh, that break down by state is hugely variable. And when you tease the data out in terms of patient population per capita, what you see is this, uh, that the top 10 states for med mal per capita, you can see number one, at least based on the most recent data that I have access to, is New York. So $31 per capita in New York. Now, when we look at the bottom 10, look at Wisconsin, $2.33 per capita. All right, so it's one thirteenth the amount is paid out in Wisconsin per capita compared to New York. So there is a, there is a significant value in where you live and where you practice. All right. So very interesting to see how that really breaks out. And you have no control over that. Now, when we start looking at the things that scare people and cause them to lose sleep, cases that tend to exceed what our malpractice limits are, you can see at least the data from California, when they had uh, greater than $1 million awards. Um, they found 217 cases over 14 years. Only 10% of them are from emergency medicine. Uh, the vast majority were in OB-GYN. Things that will really scare people are cases more than $5 million. And you can see data, at least, that initially was usually in the, in the roughly 30 range, and then all of a sudden it doubled into the 60 range. This data is very difficult to come by now. Uh, there's not a lot of it that's released. Uh, but what I would want to do is at least try to reassure people in many ways. Number one, more than half of these cases occur in just four states. Uh, so if you happen to be from Florida, Illinois, New York, or Pennsylvania, then I feel for you. Uh, there is actually a term that is used in the industry called a judicial hellhole. All right? And there actually are locations where it is known that the payouts will be larger and the risk of losing a case is higher. Um, there's decreasing numbers of cases in the 2017 data that were this high. But the most encouraging thing about this, to reassure everybody, in terms of your personal assets and those kind of things too, is plaintiffs do not typically recover these sky-high jury awards. It does not work that way. It makes the papers that somebody received a $28 million uh, judgment, but they don't show it in the papers where it's later appealed and reduced. 
and very often what will happen is they will go after the big deep pockets like the hospitals or the insurance carrier and then the provider tends to settle out at policy limits. That's pretty typical. Now what happens from these large cases though is what it does is it fuels similar cases and fuels future claims to give them basically chum in the water. All right? And it creates a lot of fear for us. All right? But it's really just about fueling the fire for other attorneys to go after this. And a lot of times the attorneys will tell you that this isn't personal, right? This is just business. Or they'll say, hey, you know, I'm looking out in the best interest of my client. Um, it has nothing to do with you. I could tell you that anybody who's been sued here will know it is highly personal, all right? It is not just business. They make it very personal in a lot of different ways. And this is not to malign attorneys because they have an obligation to their clients, all right? This is really, that's part of their job to make sure they're representing the best interest uh, of their client, but this is not about seeking justice. This is not about truth, all right? Uh, this is the American judicial system, all right? This is not about truth and justice. And it's very hard sometimes for people to separate themselves from that. And a lot of times patients will use this as a mechanism basically to get their attention, uh, to get people's attention about what happened to them. They want to understand more, and they're frustrated, obviously. It's a way to vent in many ways, too. And from our perspective, when you know where the risks are, and that's what we're going to talk about over the next couple days, you'll also know when to put the brakes on and when to actually start thinking a little bit more clearly and take a cognitive pause as you're taking care of the patient. And that's a lot of what we're hoping for, for you at least. Now, I'd hope that everybody who, who comes to this course at least would learn a couple of things about the stress that's involved and hopefully at least how to prepare yourselves for it so that you don't end up uh, losing your career over it. I would urge everybody, please do not let a case ruin your career in emergency medicine. Um, what I mentioned before about things being very personal, they will use terms like this, negligent care, incompetent, right? wanton disregard, and conscious indifference. All right? Highly, highly personal things. I could tell you that I was sued about seven years ago um, when, I received, when I was um, served. It was on my birthday in the morning. All right? There is only a one in 365 chance that that was by coincidence. All right? They know exactly what they're doing. Right? It is designed, the system is built, and they go after you to make this highly personal, to create fear so that you will hopefully settle. Right? Very, very personal in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of emotional impact in terms of what, could, what could this can do to people in terms of how they're feeling about the uh, depression and risk for even suicide and burnout as well. And you can see in this study here, uh, that was uh, looking at surgeons at least, 25% had been involved in a malpractice suit in the prior two years, and they found significant links to depression, burnout, and the thoughts of suicide as well. And this has been pretty well documented for people who have any interest in, in this. There's a couple of great articles, in particular the New England Journal article, that looks at the uh, physician suicide rate compared to the general population. Right. Males that are physicians have a 40% higher suicide rate than general population. Females, 130% higher. Right. And both uh, males and females that are, that are emergency providers are much more likely to be successful. In fact, greater than 50% are successful in committing suicide compared to about one in 15 in the general population because we know what to do. We understand things a little bit better. And you can see the risk factors there at least too. So very frightening stuff in terms of how this really can impact people's lives. Now, I doubt there's a person in this room who hasn't heard or seen any of the burnout surveys that are out there. Emergency medicine has been leading the way for many years now. Now this is the most recent data that has come out. This is currently in press. We are still the top profession within medicine in terms of burnout, but if you can take a close look at least, you can, you can see at least uh, that we're actually starting to decrease the amount of burnouts. This is actually a positive sign. We're moving in a good direction right now. Yeah. Kind of curious to think about, this is um, based upon surveys of emergency providers. What do you guys think are the top causes that, that are self-reported as the causes of burnout in emergency medicine? You hear something here. EMR, that's definitely up there. Absolutely. The electronic health record systems are notorious. What else? Stress. Stress, absolutely. What else? What's that? Malpractice itself as well. Absolutely. So you can kind of see. So the top one that was listed is bureaucratic tasks. All right. Difficult patients. Certainly we're seeing many, many more of those and a lot of entitlement expectations. The threat of malpractice, number three and then the computerization or the EHR is number four, and then a litany of other things too. All right, so there's definitely a lot of reasons why we have to potentially be at risk for burnout. 
And you can see at least the burnout report from 2019, again, most recent data, we were no longer number one. Very interesting to see now neurology and urology being up there as well. And we've decreased by 11% since 2017. So again, a positive sign at least. A little bit surprising to see physical medicine and rehab up there. Um, but again, this is self-reported data and we're all under tremendous stress. Everybody's burned out. So I think this is just something that's just pervasive within the entire industry. Now to look at the positive things, all right, we are also second from the top uh, for our satisfaction with our work-life integration, second only to dermatology. All right, so it's a very positive sign at least. So we at least enjoy our time when we're out of the emergency department. Um, you can see at least the lifestyle and happiness report, we are definitely up there in terms of being happiest outside work. And then one thing that a lot of us take for granted that we don't really think about, and that's the number of hours that we work. All right, and you can see here at least um, that we are at the bottom of the list in terms of length of hours that are worked in the, uh, in, on any given month. All right, so that's a huge thing that we think about. So outside work, we actually maintain a good balance, but when we're there, we are all in. And I think that's a lot of the two. So you're kind of thinking about the emotions and the impact that that has during any given shift. All right. Now this is a study that was actually done in Europe. Uh, they looked at almost 50 different hospitals. It was ICU-based, but they looked at almost 1,500 providers. And what they found was that emotional exhaustion was directly tied to standardized mortality ratios, as well as their own perception of patient safety, too. So there's a real impact on patient care in terms of burnout. And this is a study that's actually uh, relatively recent, too, that, actually, that looked at surgeons getting 360 degree reviews by their peers, by nursing staff, and their colleagues. And what they found is that people who had what they described as problematic behavior had a higher risk of malpractice claims, a significantly higher risk of malpractice claims. For those that were in the bottom 10th percentile, so if you did not consider suggestions of your peers, six times increased risk of being sued. If you snap at others with fr being, when you're frustrated, if you don't pay attention to other people, if you're not informing the team of what's happening, or if you're talking down to the other members of your team, they're not gonna wanna talk to you, they'll avoid you, that increases your risk of being sued, and obviously not good for patient care either. So clearly how you're behaving and how you're feeling can have a direct impact on your risk of being sued and the patient care. And patients perceive this, they're not stupid. When we look at things, I mean, certainly you get an unhappy patient plus a bad outcome, that's all it really takes to generate a claim. And when we look at Prescani scores, at least from the inpatient side, providers that score in the bottom third um, had twice and a half, two and a half times as many complaints uh, from their patients and were 110% more likely to have malpractice suits. And the title of this, I love when the title just tells you the answer, but this is really it, all right? How patients perceive their care has nothing to do with the quality you provide. It really has to do with how well you listen, how well you explain things, showing them basic respect, and taking enough time. Now, we often don't have enough time in the emergency department or in urgent care settings, but we can certainly do the other things. And for those, there might be some people who recognize these four questions. These are also the HCAPS questions that are asked repeatedly also. So this directly correlates. Okay. Now, from the emergency medicine literature, you can see here, great study looked at 146,000 press gainy surveys, 34 emergency departments over several years, actually found that satisfaction scores did not correlate with risk. What they found is complaints correlate with risk. And those physicians that had two or more complaints within a single quarter were four times as likely to have some kind of a risk management episode. And so I think everybody already knows, wherever you work, you know who the people are that are difficult to work with and getting complaints from their patients. Those are the people that are gonna be increased risk. And so if you're one of those individuals, take that to heart, think about it a little bit at least, and try to change some of the things in the way you're doing stuff. This is a real form that was given to us, um, at my hospital at least, in terms of this was the complaints that the patient had. And I have a colleague who loves to repeatedly say, tell me where else your pain radiates other than my neck. And I think that's the kind of thing where you really want to at least bite your tongue and certainly don't vent, all right? You'd never want to vent at the patient and not in the medical record either. This is real, this is from a resident who was rotating in my department who described a quote, very annoying 62 year old lady with a past medical history of chronic pain. Probably not a great thing to put in the chart. Maybe a little bit worse than that is this one here where a patient was given a four pack of Vicodin and a prescription for Motrin and told to eat a big can of suck it up and quit his whining. Um, you really don't want to put those kind of things in the chart. Remember, patients can actually look at their records and they do. All right, somebody sees this, it's not going to go well for you and you're probably going to end up with a complaint not only to the hospital but potentially to the medical board. 
and you can't justify that. And certainly there are some people that take it to the whole other level. Please don't go there and be this guy too. I love how it just goes back and just keeps suturing. <laughs> so clearly, again, there are things that you just don't want to do in medicine. And I'm going to switch gears here and give you a couple of pearls, at least, about things to look at. Uh, so the first one starts off with just basically the importance of ownership of your diagnostic results. Right? This is a key thing, and particularly with the speed that we're moving in departments, this is so important. I'm going to start with our first real case, which is the story of Rory Staunton who some of you might have heard about at least. Uh, this was a boy several years ago in New York who had sustained basically an abrasion to, um, to his leg uh, during gym class and came into his pediatrician a couple days later with nausea, vomiting, and a fever, was then sent to the emergency department, went to NYU, and you can see this is just directly from the chart and from the records at least. Uh, what had happened was basically uh, that uh, he was febrile, heart rate was 131, um, but the time that those vital signs were recorded by the nurse he had, the physician had already clicked the discharge instructions, and they weren't aware that the patient had spiked a fever and became dachycardic. And so they were never really told about that, and on top of that, hours after he left, the remainder of the differential of his CBC came back showing 53% bands, which, since the patient was already discharged from the system, nobody ever saw. And that's not really considered to be a critical value. In fact, I don't think in any of the hospitals that I've ever been at, that's considered to be critical. So no one ever looked at it. No one knew about it. Parents were never told about it. And unfortunately, what happened, uh, he was diagnosed as gastroenteritis, which we'll talk about in a little bit, about a, one of those things never to put on a chart. And unfortunately, he died just a few days later. Now, this was a case that actually garnered national attention and created changes within New York State in terms of laws that were passed, too. But it highlights the importance of critical communication skills between your nursing staff and providers and to make sure that you have some kind of a policy for notification of abnormal vitals prior to any patient being discharged from your department and the critical importance of following up on any diagnostics that are performed in your department. So I'm just kind of curious here by a show of hands. How many of you have a policy where you work that if any study is ordered, whether it's an EKG, a chest x-ray, a lab, that if a patient elopes from your department, that before they're taken off of the tracking board, that somebody is notified that, hey, Dr. So-and-so, um, patient X just left the department, can you please take a look at their labs? How many of you actually have that kind of a policy set up in your department? Just give me a show of hands here so I can kind of get a feel here. I'm seeing very, very few, so I'm seeing maybe about 5% of this room. And I'll tell you at least, this is critically important, especially in terms of how we operate as a profession these days, because it's very common in most places across the country to have some kind of provider and triage system or a nursing triage protocol or standing orders that labs are being ordered, EKGs are being ordered, and if a patient walks out of the department, unless there's a critical finding like a white count of 0.1 uh, or a positive troponin, lab may never call you to tell you that a patient has a creatinine of 7.8, which might be new onset for that person. And if they've been discharged from the hospital, you would never even know that the patient was never, uh, because they were never put in a bed, they left straight from the waiting room. But your name is on that chart, and somebody's responsible for that, including the hospital being on the hook, and some providers probably on the hook for that as well. I'll give you a great example here, second real case. This is a patient who had eloped from an emergency department, had a chest x-ray that was done. This is a comment that was sent by a physician after they got a coder communication from the coders who said that, hey, you never dictated the, your interpretation of the chest x-ray. And so what they said was, yeah, well, this showed a mass that I hadn't even known about. Radiology never called them about it um, and saved them from a lawsuit because they actually got a coder communication from somebody who was just trying to make sure they were maxing out the billing. Right? So scary stuff that can be out there. So having a system in place to reconcile any abnormal results is critical. And so I would urge you that uh, if you don't do it yourself, if you're not one of the leaders in your department, please make sure you talk to your medical directors about putting some kind of a closed loop system into place so that if a patient leaves prior to completely their evaluation, that somebody looks at all the tests that were done to confirm that there was nothing that's critical that the patient needs to be notified about. There has been a multitude of lawsuits relating to these kind of cases, and they are escalating. Right? This is a great uh, lesson to learn, at least if you look at this study by Greg Moore, or at least this article that he had talked about, where one of the cases in particular was a lung nodule that was seen on the x-ray, nobody ever notified the patient, ultimately became uh, metastatic, and the patient died from uh, metastatic lung carcinoma, $20.5 million judgment because of that. 
And this is in the lay press, too. Um, everybody hears about these things. Now you can see from the Wall Street Journal, surprise, medical, surprise results in uh, uh, tests draw a new focus, looking for appendicitis, find a liver problem. You've got to make sure you're reading all the text that the radiologist dictates. Don't just look at the, at the final impression. You gotta read between the fine lines and the multiple paragraphs. A lot of times it'll say, you know, two centimeter adrenal nodule, recommend follow up. If you don't look at the whole thing and tell the patient about it, it's hot potato. Whoever saw that patient last is responsible for it. And this has been studied too. This is a study where they looked at over 3,200 patients at Mass General. Uh, just about one in 20 cases, there was a recommendation from the radiologist for a non-emergent follow-up. And three quarters of the time, it was related to something that was a possible malignancy. And yet, when they looked at everything, only half of the time did the discharge instructions even mention anything about that finding. I would urge you to not only type it into your discharge instructions, but document in your record that the patient was notified about the finding and the importance of follow-up. Even better, say the patient was notified of the possibility of cancer and the importance of follow-up. Be very specific. A lot of times, otherwise, when the, when the you know, it hits the fan, what will end up happening is they'll just say, they didn't ex if I had known it was possible cancer, I would have seen my doctor immediately. Nobody ever told me is a very common excuse that is given. Third case. This is an 11-year-old male. Um, he had 12 hours of worsening achy abdominal pain. It was initially diffuse, began to migrate to his right lower quadrant. He vomited three times and had no dysuria, uh, no hematuria, no fever. His vital signs are unremarkable. He had focal right lower quadrant tenderness. I think everybody hopefully can have an idea of where we're going with this. White count was normal. Chem panel was normal. Urinalysis showed some ketones, but otherwise unremarkable. In this case, I love that they started with an abdominal ultrasound, at least to avoid the radiation. Unfortunately, they couldn't visualize the appendix. They reassessed the patient and documented a reassessment. Fantastic. Love to see that whenever I'm reviewing medical records. He had continued right lower quadrant tenderness. And the decision at that point was to obtain a CT scan. And they, and they actually had a conversation, shared decision making with the patient's father and documented that. Again, fantastic from a medical legal liability protection standpoint that they did that. So in this particular case, there was a change of shift that happened, and the CT scan was pending. And so in this shop, at least, what they did was they printed the discharge instructions in advance, told the oncoming provider, hey, if the CT scan's negative, he can go home. And I'm kind of curious, how many people in your shop would that be pretty typical to do something like that, to kind of print things up in advance to help your colleague? Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of hands, maybe about half the people. And this is very common practice. You're just trying to facilitate the care. In this case, CT scan showed acute appendicitis, dilated appendix, two appendicoliths, done deal. Why am I talking about this case? Because here's how it actually went. So not only did the physicians change shift, nursing staff change shift at the same time. CT scan gets completed, gets read at uh, just before 9 p.m., hugely busy shift. The oncoming provider is just going on seeing their patients, and meanwhile, the oncoming nurse sees the discharge paperwork, grabs it, discharges the patient home. And unfortunately, in this particular case, came back the next day, perforated appendicitis. All right. This is an increasingly common problem that we're starting to see a lot of. It has to do with just, it's a systems issue, right? This is communications. All right. And communications breakdown are notorious. They're involved in about one in four ED malpractice claims. All right. There's a lot of data there, and all this, again, I've got all the references in there. If you guys want to download them as well, they're all on the website. Just take them down. Believe me, there's very interesting reading about this. My recommendations would be that you really want to have a structured handoff process to reduce errors. By far, the most dangerous procedure we perform in the emergency department on a day-to-day -day basis is a change of shift. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind about that. This is where a ton of medical errors happen and where the ball gets dropped repeatedly. Respect that procedure as a high-risk procedure and think of it as a procedure. Do a face-to-face -face evaluation uh, with the oncoming provider is what I would recommend. You should definitely document a reassessment of that patient that you just picked up by somebody. And even better, involve the nurse so that they understand the system too and what the plan is for that patient. Had that occurred in this, pa in this patient's case, they would never would have been discharged. So the multiple communication breakdowns can happen, um, especially when there's changes of shifts with both nurses and physicians. But there's also a sense of diagnostic ownership. Where's radiology in this process? It would be nice to have an additional safety net where you have a radiology system in place that if there's an emergent issue, anything that requires surgical intervention, that there should maybe be a phone call, right? If that system had been in place in this shop, 
That would be another way to help prevent that medical error from happening. Right? And when I talk about the risk management and all this, is, again, this is not about just CYA, it's about quality care. Right? It's trying to help you avoid the missed diagnosis. But if you do miss the diagnosis, hopefully at least you also want to avoid the claim itself, prevent the genesis of the claim. And if a claim does happen, then we want to make the case as defensible as possible. And so again, when you know where the danger areas are, then you know how to change your practice. And I'll tell you at least, here's several of the ones that we see in terms of high-risk impressions. The first being atypical chest pain. Right? There's no need to ever use the word atypical in a diagnostic impression. Just call it chest pain. This is the EKG of a patient who was diagnosed as atypical chest pain. Yeah, it was atypical for ACS because this patient had an aortic dissection. Right? They were a cocaine user, known cocaine user, hypertension, non-specific EKG changes, misdiagnosis, bad outcome. Very difficult to defend the case from just that one word. You'll still end up potentially in a case if you miss the diagnosis, but adding the word atypical to it raises the difficulty of being able to defend it, raises the amount that gets paid out. Anxiety. All right, this is another big one here. I would be very cautious and put the brakes on before you ever give a diagnosis of new onset anxiety for somebody. Think about what the cause of that anxiety might be. Start thinking about maybe pulmonary embolus as the cause of their sensation of dyspnea. Think about ACS. A lot of times this could be chicken or egg. Very difficult to figure out which. Constipation is another big one that we tend to see on charts. I would urge you not to put that on the chart. Um, constipation certainly can cause abdominal pain. It will rarely cause tenderness. Right? And you have to really think about that, especially in the elderly, uh, when everybody has any kind of abdominal pain or tenderness. And in particular, I would avoid getting x-rays of this too. This is just a form of confirmation bias. You're looking for stool. Well, if you get an x-ray of the abdomen, I guarantee you're going to find stool. So all of this is just validate the diagnosis that you thought the patient had to begin with. So very dangerous thing to put on the chart, as well as the term atypical migraine. All right? When we see these on the charts, these tend to be very often missed craniocervical dissections, missed CVAs, missed subarachnoid hemorrhages. Just call it headache, call it cephalgia, right? D call it migraine if they have a known history of migraine, but don't call it atypical migraine. As soon as it's atypical, then there's something wrong with it. There's something different about that. Don't go off on that. It's not worth it. It doesn't add to your billing either. So the word atypical just does not have any place on the chart. Teething is another one that there's been some risk with. Um, and you can see at least that a meta-analysis that was done in 2016 found essentially that teething is pretty unlikely to cause a true fever in most cases or any other clinically important symptoms. And there's no pattern of symptoms that's diagnostically reliable in these cases either. Now, by far the highest risk one that we tend to see in terms of impressions put on the chart is gastroenteritis. These, this is just a litany of cases that I was able to find uh, through a search of the Westlaw database, and you can see the outcomes of some of these missed appendicitis cases, including quadriplegia. I'm like, my God, from a perfed appy. Absolutely crazy. Brain injury, death, all of these cases. Better to just put abdominal pain as the primary impression and nausea and vomiting as a secondary. Gastroenteritis as a diagnosis is very hard to defend because, number one, there's no diagnostic test that you can perform that proves it's gastroenteritis. That's one of the key things. It's harder to defend the same outcome just based on the words that you put on the chart. And that's what a lot of things are in med mal to begin with. It's all semantics. It doesn't have to make logical sense. It's just the way the system works. So how you put things on, how you term things, makes the huge difference. Here's another litany of cases that I was able to find, all of which were diagnosed on discharge as gastroenteritis. And you can see the range of things that was missing, everything from shaken baby syndrome because of the continued vomiting, septic shock, ruptured AAA, ovarian torsions, and one case in aortic dissection. This is a patient actually, this individual was giving testimony in court on the stand and came and suddenly developed nausea and vomiting, anxiety, leg numbness, and back pain. Was diagnosed with a double whammy of both acute panic reaction as well as gastroenteritis, discharged, and then died 12 hours later from tamponade from his dissection. All right, so these kind of cases are out there just so much better just to use the impression of whatever symptom they're having rather than trying to guess what it actually is. So here's my recommendations. The first is stop using the term diagnosis. From a med mal standpoint, the term diagnosis implies a completed product. Instead, just use clinical impression. Again, every word matters, makes it more defensible. All right. Own your diagnostic results 
and that includes talking with the patient and reevaluating them, documenting your reevaluation, and discussing the diagnostic limitations with the patients. Have humility about that. Explain no CAT scan is perfect, no test is perfect. There's always the chance we're going to miss something, but right now I don't see anything. If you get worse, come back. And don't delegate that to a nurse. You should be doing that yourself. Don't say, okay, just give them all the results. That communication is absolutely critical. Make sure they understand it, and make sure you find out what they're worried about, too. That's going to be a really huge thing to help protect you going down the line. And then the three-visit rule. Someone comes in a third time, a lot of times people roll their eyes, get frustrated, like, oh, great, they're back again. Look at that as an opportunity. I put that on its head. This is an opportunity to make the correct diagnosis that was missed the first couple times. Yes, there are patients that are going to take advantage of the system, but you don't want to label them as that. I think it's a very dangerous practice to do that. It puts the patient at risk, as well as yourself. So a lot of this comes down to communication, perception, how the patients view you, how they view things. You don't want to be this guy, right? Don't act like that to the patient. Instead, think of yourself as on stage. Perform like the patient expects you to. Be the doctor that they've seen or the APP they've seen on TV. That's what they're expecting. Right? And so a lot of times you want to do is sit down to the best you can. In my shop, at least, a lot of times we're missing chairs. I sit down on top of the garbage can. Get at their eye level. Don't talk down to them. And do the best that you can to just listen for one minute. It can be very challenging when their history starts. Well, back in 1974, you're like, oh boy, you know it's going to be a long time. Let them talk for a minute and then interrupt. But give them a chance at least to get something out first. And try your best to give them your undivided attention, right? Try not to answer the phone. Try not to be distracted. Obviously, that's going to be a difficult thing. But at least let them perceive that you're really listening to them. And then establish realistic expectations up front. My residents know I will tell them this often. I like to use the term signposting. If you walk into the room and you have an 85-year-old with crushing substernal chest pating radiating to the left arm, I haven't even seen their EKG or chest x-ray. I know they're coming in, most likely. Let them know that. Someone comes in with worst headache of life, thunderclap headache. Don't just get the CAT scan and then later, two hours or four hours later, go, okay, now I'm going to stick a needle in your spine. Tell them up front what the plan is going to be. Let them know how long it's going to take and exceed those expectations. If you think it's going to take four hours, tell them it's going to be six. If you exceed their expectations, they'll be thrilled. If you take one minute longer than you told them, they will think it's the worst department they've ever had and you're the worst provider they've ever been with. So really do your best to communicate those things with them. It will help them perceive things better. It'll help you have a better day as well. I talked a little bit ago about explaining the results. Try your best to sit down a little bit and help them understand that you can't always make a diagnosis. A lot of times, patients will be incredibly frustrated. I would be too if I was a layperson and I just sat in a department for 10 hours. I'm going to get a $25,000 or more bill, and you tell me you, can't even know, you don't even know what's going on with me. A lot of times what I'll say, and I'll say it up front, someone comes in with belly pain, I'll go, look, we're going to order these tests, and a lot of times we don't even find out what it is, but anything I could find on you is usually bad news. That's usually well received when you come back later and go, hey, it's good news, I couldn't find anything. At least they understand that there's not always going to be a diagnosis there, that you're going to have further workup as necessary as an outpatient. Uh, make sure they understand everything, too, that they can really get a good feel for how you feel about them and what concerns you might have, how important it is maybe to follow up for things. Have shared decision making. Maybe they're there that you did the right care for them, but it wasn't addressing what their concerns were. They're there for a headache, and maybe they're concerned more about the fact that their grandmother just died of brain cancer, and they're worried about cancer. Meanwhile, you're using an evidence-based rule, and you're telling them, hey, it's great news. I can save you several thousand dollars, and you don't need to be radiated either. But in reality, all they wanted was a CAT scan because they need to sleep well at night. So understand what their concerns are. Make sure you can address those concerns and have that humility to explain again, yeah, there's a chance there's a hidden fracture on this x-ray. It may not show up now, we're going to put you in a splint today, five days from now. If you're still having pain, we might re-x-ray it. Sometimes the break shows up then. That same patient will view things very differently because now you're the doctor or the, or the APP who told them, yeah, they said there might be a hidden fracture versus the person who said, everything's normal, you can go home, there's nothing wrong. That same fracture gets identified five days later. Now they're pissed. Now, the, now you're the person who missed the diagnosis. Same outcome, but it's all about how you spin the things and how you communicate with them together. So it's all about that humility when you talk with them. So what I'd hope you take away from this, again, I don't want you to be afraid of the climate out there. What we talk about over the next couple of days is to help prepare you for the inevitability of what a lot of us are going to go through 
and help make you not only more resilient to deal with these things, but hopefully help abort a case before it can even start. And that always starts just with the communication. The average person in this room most likely is going to see about 100,000 patients in their career. All right? It's inevitable you're going to have some bad outcomes. But if you communicate well, if you document well, you're not going to add any bait for those attorneys. I think that's going to be one of those key things. And then certainly take a look around your shop, see what kind of systems you have in place, get some good, solid risk management policies in place, and practice well as a team. That teamwork will help protect you. One quick video, and then I'll step off here. Everybody makes mistakes, even doctors. You forgot to I say. I forgot to say clear. All right. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Welcome to the 30th Annual High Risk Emergency Medicine course.